Welcome to our online microbiology journal club. Um, today we are talking about giant viruses. So I should like, you know, ah, do a perspective thing. Um, but I, I'm very excited about this because it's always a fun topic to talk about viruses in terms of, uh, in my microbiology classes, we always discuss are viruses alive? And these giant viruses kind of offer a little bit of a wrinkle. So if some of if a microbiology student does their homework, they could always bring the giant virus into the discussion uh, because they throw off some of our assumptions about what viruses are and are not. We'll get into that as we talk about the paper more, uh, but very quickly we'll do some introductions. My name is Laura Williams. I'm an assistant professor at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. And with me today is Nicole. Nicole, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep. Hello, I'm Nicole Sukdio, and I am a sessional instructor teaching 200 level microbiology at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And I will also be on the job market as of April 28th. So if you need somebody who could teach 200 level biology or biochemistry, I might be your person. Hire Nicole, hire Nicole. <laughs> we put in a plug for Nicole. Um, all right, so. Uh, I, I could it, so Nicole, I think you and Elena, and I'm not sure if Elena is going to be able to join us. Um, I hear from Nicole that Elena might be not feeling well. Um, maybe she'll pop in a little bit later. But I think Nicole, you and Elena had been discussing this paper and suggested it for the uh, journal club. Do you want to explain a little bit about how it came across your radar? Oh, here we go. I think I'm unmuted now. I am pretty sure that. I just saw it appear on someone's Twitter feed. And I have sort of in my course a microbes on the news forum that hasn't been heavily utilized up until this point, but now it might be because students are realizing that they can offset their quiz grades by contributing. So <laughs> I posted this and I also brought it into one of my assessments to talk about basically this idea of, you know, what are the size constraints on sort of a genomic cargo. So I asked a question based on, on capsid sizes, sort of that sort of thing, because we know say with a phage, there is sort of a, a limit on how much stuff you can stuff into a phage head. Uh, with my discussion with Elena, I think we had both kind of come across the paper and had a Facebook chat and talked about how, how neat the study just was in terms of uncovering some deep sea viral biodiversity, definitely thinking about, you know, what is up with this genome, although this study doesn't really get, well, they admit that they don't know how much of that translational machinery is being expressed, but it definitely is falling into, you know, characteristics shared by um, Mimi viruses, which also have a lot of translational stuff coming along for the ride in that genome and maybe not just coming along for the ride, maybe being expressed, but also just a lot of the interesting ecological insights that come out of this paper with respect to the infection trial. So some of that abortive infection, some of the successful infection, and some hints dropped by the authors themselves about the ecological significance of some of the abortive infectious cycles and why that may actually help the virus out. So I'm kind of leading a bit, but in addition to that, I love this paper because it's really, really clearly written up, even though there's a lot going on. And it kind of does work from sort of these model infection systems to make us understand that these things are big, but they're big and productive, even though we don't really know how this life cycle plays out in the deep ocean or the soda lakes from which they were is isolated. That, uh, that's great. That's a great kind of um, explanation of why it was interesting. And I, I agree with you on many of those points, if not all of them. Um, and it was a good preview of kind of the types of things that they talk about in this paper. Um, I think well, maybe what I want to do is very briefly for people who perhaps do, do not know, um, this is of the field of study of these giant viruses is a really interesting one. There's something called Mimi virus, which I think was, was that, I think that might've been the first giant virus that was discovered. Now you have things like Pandora virus and so forth. Um, and as I understand it, I think that these giant viruses are typically infecting amoeba. So they're infecting um, and invading protists. 
We don't know of any giant viruses that invade animal cells, to my knowledge, and we don't know of any giant viruses that invade bacteria. Um, largely with bacteria, I think it's going to be a size constraint just because, especially with this uh, virus described here, it's about the size of an E. coli cell. So you would have a really hard time infecting an E. coli cell if you're this size. So it seems to be, from what I understand, mostly the target of infection and invasion is going to be protists um, and these amoeba. They'll, they'll mention a couple in the paper. Um, and, and in the introduction, they kind of set up this idea that contrary to what we typically think of with viruses, so we normally think of viruses as being um, having a very small genome. That's one of the things we talked about in my microbiology class is just, you know, in some cases you've got viruses where their genome is a couple dozen kilobases, if that, and it codes for maybe like nine things, 11 things, you know, not that much in terms of gene content that's carried on the viral genome. That's not true for these giant viruses. They're, they're much larger in terms of genome size, and then they're just much larger as structures as well. Um, and I thought maybe what we could do is we could look at, because one of the things I really loved about this paper is they've got some beautiful microscopy of these viruses. And so I think it's worth it to kind of just pop these up like I normally do. Sorry, I'm trying to look around my, my screen so I can do this screen sharing thing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pop up the paper so that we can look at this first figure. So this is figure one. And one of the things that I thought was neat about this is that panel 1A, so up in the top left corner, this is a picture of the virus particles at 1,000x microscopy. And the reason that that stuck out to me is because in the predatory bacteria, in my lab we study predatory bacteria, and you can pretty much only see these predatory bacteria at about 1,000x phase contrast microscopy. And so when we're looking for, it was interesting to me because I'm just thinking about scale. It's just, you know, at the same magnification that we're seeing tiny specks that, that indicate that we've got active predatory cells. What they've got here is a, is a picture of the field, the microscope field, where these little specks are individual Tupin viruses, which I think is really neat. Um, and then there's some other just really incredible, like the SEM images down there at C and D. Those are amazing. Um, I don't know, Nicole, is this similar to any kind of viruses that, that you've seen before or? Um, no, I can't really admit to being that virus literate other than my experiences with the common cold experientially and whatever I've had to che teach from chapter 6 and 27 of the textbook that I that I teach from but I mean this is definitely um so there's two questions that come to my mind as a biochemist and sort of somebody who's sort of fixated on the metabolic aspects of, of microbiology when I teach and the first thing is that they do have that section of the paper that talks about all the fibrils that you can see in figure 1b so like that's sort of yeah. the giant fuzzy virus business and that you can actually pull those off with with commonly used proteases um bromelain's the only one that comes to mind but they mentioned a couple where they can actually hack off those yeah lysozyme uh, bromelain yeah. and proteinase k yeah yeah so it's interesting because part of it is, well, okay, you can hack those off and then the, the, the macromolecular superstructure of the rest of the capsid remains intact. And presumably some of that just might be that you've got so much packing that an endoprotease can't really get in there. But right. it's also just interesting to think about like why you'd want to have protein labile fibrils all over you, because I mean, they this paper doesn't really get into attachment properties that sort of thing what does this mean as far as a resource context for any heterotrophs that might be co-occurring that aren't phagocytic like there's i mean this is it's maybe a reach but it's also just thinking about like the fact that this virus in and of itself is an entity that exists you know amongst microbes that yeah. are that are eating assimilatively and very intimately biochemically and occasionally eating very physically, as we see with the case of the phagocytic amoebozoa that they use in their trials. 
you know, there might be a lot for them to sort of contribute from a nutrient context to wherever they happen to be. Yeah, that's, that's, I agree with you. I think this is, uh, the fibrils or the, the t I don't know if you would call the tail fibers in this case, or if there's, that's a specific term, because I have to admit I'm not a virologist either. Um, but I just think that their images of the structure are just incredibly striking. Um, and I also think it's interesting too that they pointed out, if you look at B in particular, I think, they, they have something in the text where they say that their microscopy is suggesting that the capsid and the tail are not tightly attached. So that's awesome because I watched the supplementary video. I and couldn't get of, the supplementary video to work. Dang it. Okay. It kind of does this weird sort of bobblehead business, like just a little bit. And it's, it's both, uh. adorable, but also just... I mean, that's really cool. What do you think about the fact that, you know, it doesn't look that physically yeah. associated, but there's still obviously some type of intermolecular something or other going on there. So, and you've yeah. got cargo release from both ends once it's endocytosed. So it's, it's, it's right. And I think yeah, that's yeah. what, I think that's what E and F are, are, are showing. Yeah. Yes. Um, which I have to admit, I got a look because I'm not terrifically used to looking at uh, TEM images like this. So I got a little bit like, oh, I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at. Um, but I think what we're looking at in E and F is it's been phagocytized. So it's it, my understanding is that it's in a phagosome in the amoeba. And then what's happening is you're looking at, um, I thought it was an invagination of the amoeba cytoplasm into the tail in the top panel and then into the capsid in the bottom panel. Now, it actually says the reverse in the legend. And so I don't know if I'm just horribly misinterpreting the virus structure or if that maybe is just a, a, a mix up. But, um, but regardless, it's really interesting. Just like you said, Nicole, it's like both the contents of both of these kind of uh, making it into the amoeba cytoplasm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's a really interesting system here and I mean when I don't really do you recall if the paper mentions which m that the genome is localized in or do they just not go there cuz like I I assume it's the capsid. Okay. That's well, my assumption. Yeah, but I don't know if they ever Well, okay. So when you say capsid, do you mean the whole the head and tail or do you mean the Oh, I just mean the head. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that's Yeah, true. okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. It's just one of those questions I ask cuz sometimes I'm never sure cuz this is still outside of you know, the paradigm of of like a phage where you expect things to be stuffed in the head because it's not really that true but, that's yeah. true yeah and i was just looking to see if they describe they seem to be using capsid to describe the head and tail to describe the the other structure okay because that was something that i found a bit disorienting because i just don't really know what committed virologists call got it their virus parts but i can yeah. i can accept that that makes sense okay yeah, yeah, that, no, that's good to clarify that, whether or not that's consistent across other types of viruses, um, I'm not sure. But in their case, the way they're discussing it here, you could kind of like, like in figure B, or in panel B, I think the, the bit on the, the right is the capsid, the head, and then the rest of it is the tail. That's, that's my interpretation of it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I want to kind of move on a little bit to their other... I'm gonna do the thing where I try not to make everybody sick while I slide this down. Um, they also have some other really awesome microscopy, which I thought we should take a look at. Uh, again, A is essentially just a, a TEM image where it's showing the um, kind of the, the capsid, the tail, kind of the parts that you can see. I thought it was neat that they basically took the, took the virus and then they did transverse sections so I actually had to think a little bit about what B was, but it's, it's what they're calling the Stargate Vertex. And at first I thought, Stargate, that was like a movie, Kurt Russell, like back in the day. You're doing better than I did, because I thought they meant Starboard. And I'm like, wait, do they actually describe the ends of viruses this way? So I went to, what was it, reference eight, to kind of see what this Stargate business was. And it turns out that the reference that they used, it's referred to as sort of a star type, 
protein contour assembly on the capsid of the related virus that they were sort of pulling this terminology from. And that paper's got some really interesting um, sort of EM and digital reconstruction of this sort of piece, which I think in the reference when they start talking about the Stargate in the paper actually looks like it might have some attachment or functional significance in the, the other virus that they referred to, which is kind of cool. Got it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I think I can kind of conceptualize what they're talking about because if the capsid is, and I have to admit now, I don't now recall, um, is it an icosahedron or is it not, do they not actually? Uh, that's funny. I, I don't actually now remember if they ever straight up said, uh, but, but my guess is that this is, this is kind of, you can see the kind of like geometric shape in the TEM image. And I'm guessing that the vertex is like a point where kind of the different planes of the capsid structure kind of join. And so if you slice it as a transverse section at that point, you're going to kind of see the, the planes coming down from it. That's, that's what I thought. Um, I could have convinced myself of something that's not actually right. I think you're right, actually. It's, it's okay. actually, but I, I agree with you. That's just really cool that this thing is big enough that we can get, you know, this sort of anatomical, yeah, the section of, of, of the virion, really. So, and it's neat because I feel like what they did is they basically started at the top. So that, like, I think B might be kind of like the top of the, um, the capsid. And then C is a section farther down, like maybe through the middle of the capsid. And then D is a section through the tail so that you kind of see it going up and down essentially. Um, but then I, I, since you brought it up, I already, I wanted to point this out, like F and H, those are, and, and G I think as well, those are images of the virus, mm. just like you said, Nicole, when mm. it had been treated to remove the fibers and the, the fibrils are, I think, I can't remember which term, fiber, they're using fibers, I suppose. Um, and you can kind of see it at that point, it just looks like like a little mushroom or something. Um, and it's neat to kind of see what that structure looks like without all those little appendages. Absolutely. Um, I, I've just, I've just been thinking that it looks like the really stubby version of the chicken wing or a drumstick. So that's, yeah, that's true. Weird. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> No, it's 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 really really gratifying to see you know something like this you know almost sort of a very organismal whole approach to looking at something like this in part owing to the fact that it is as big as it is and that this is feasible. Even so, these are beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are beautiful microscope images. Yeah, and of course, I mean, also really gratifying is sort of O through Q, which is not scrolled up, but the fact that, you know, they've got, they've definitely got mm -hmm. evidence that you can have productive, you know, epicenters of, of, of viral replication and, you know, viral particle production, which is, yeah. is great. Like, it's, it's just nice to kind of see see the snapshots of the process and all and also being able to see like the whole capsid and tail fiber assembly on the periphery particularly in p it's kind of neat to see yeah assembled yeah those are those are pretty cool yeah um it, it, it's a really i'm i'm t i have to think about this conceptually but i'm really tempted to potentially use these images to explain virus infection cycles um, I'd have to think about whether or not in doing that in a general microbiology class, you run the risk of confusing people because these are kind of an, a, an outlier in the virus world, but, but you can see all this stuff so well, it helps kind of think about what's going on. Like the, the panel L, um, shows the attachments and then it gets, it gets taken into the amoeba and then you could see the phagosomes and then you can kind of see the viral factory. And then like, just like you said in P, you could see all the new viruses being produced. And um, yeah, I don't know that I've, I don't know that I've really seen, I've seen animations that show this for like influenza, but to actually see it with the real virus, I think is cool.
So rhetorically in my class, and, and we will have to move on from this figure, but I just want to say that how I've set up the virus unit with my students is I basically tell them that it's like breaking into someone's house and stealing their 3D printer or or just you know, hijacking it to make more copies of yourself. And I think I think you can, I mean, it's true that these kind of fall out of sort of the paradigms of viral infection that we usually teach, particularly with the lytic and lysogenic cycles, which usually are the first model that students see at many levels of undergraduate and high school biology. But but you're seeing the propagation of the form. So mm -hmm. I think I, it's definitely reinforcing that idea in the conventional, you know, narrative of what a viral life cycle should should culminate in. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. So it might be a good way to have them kind of think about, like if you've introduced the virus life cycle, this would be a good thing to show them in terms of, okay, now that we've talked in general terms about the virus life cycle, here's what's going on with this thing. Do you kind of recognize the steps that we've discussed? What do you think is going on at these different stages? That kind of stuff. Absolutely. Um, very cool. So uh, just like you said, we probably have to move on from beautiful microscope images, sadly. Um, but I think that's a, that's a really good place that they started with. They started with this kind of, they've discovered these viruses. So they started with a description of what have we got? What does it look like? What do we know about it? And then they kind of start getting into um, so then they're starting to look at the genome. So they've got uh, two genomes, a Tupin virus from a soda lake and a Tupin virus from the deep ocean. And so what they've done is they've uh, sequenced it. They're linear, double-stranded DNA molecules. They uh, are both about 1.5 million bases. So that's long for a virus genome. Um, and they wanted to kind of understand what are they, what is that gene content related to? So they've got a really nice figure where they do um, what I'm assuming are bi-directional best hits. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to take a gene and, or maybe it's just, it might not be bi-directional, it might just be a best hit. So I think what they've done is they've, got, they've taken the, the genes in the Tupin virus genome and then they um, probably blast it but they're going to compare it to a database of other genes and they're just going to find, in this case, it's probably not bi-directional. They're just going to find its best hit in the database and, and kind of point out where was that best hit? What organism did that best hit come from? And so what they're going to do is they're going to show, let me see if I can get this. Ah, there we go. Application. Here we go. Sure. All right, so what we've got is on the left, we've got um, this really cool, I think, really cool uh, diagram that's showing that best hit information. And so along the right, you've got the Tupin virus genome. And each one of those, I really like this figure, each one of those little um, dashes, I guess, across that part of the circle is going to indicate a, uh, an open reading frame or a gene that they're comparing it to. And then what they've got along the left are viruses, archaea, eukaryotes, and bacteria. And those are our organisms within those big groupings that had a gene that was the best hit for one of the Tupin virus genes. So what they've done, and I wonder if this is like a Circos plot or something like that, the infamous Circos plots, but um, it basically what they're going to do is they're going to draw a line from the gene in the Tupin virus genome to its best hit if it's in viruses, archaea, eukaryotes, or bacteria. And so then what you're looking at is basically uh, everything that's red that pulls into the viruses, that's showing you that like lots of those genes uh, in the Tupin virus genome are gonna have best hits to other viruses. That's not too surprising. But then you've also got some stuff that the best hit is in archaea or eukaryotes or bacteria. And I thought that this was a really neat way because I've done this type of analysis before and I've always struggled with how to kind of show, show it. I just thought this was a really neat way to show this. Um, 
what did you think about this figure, Nicole? So I think this is probably the first time in my life where I've looked at a circus type plot and not wanted to assume the fetal position under my bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it was just like, oh, okay. I mean, I can I can buy the red density. One of the things that's really interesting about this is I've been going down some procrastinative rabbit holes because, like I said, this paper was on my well, a colloquialized version of a summary of the paper was on my microbes in the news forum, and I did get a, a question from a student about inhibition for efficiency of viral replication just because the genome's that big. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, and I actually have to go back because I kind of made the argument. It's just like, well, in their model infection cycles, you can see viral factories and, and novel nucleocapsid assembly. So it's clearly not a problem, but I ended up looking up uh, genome sizes for the amoebozoa. And the one thing I came oh. across was a blog post about the amount of sort of archaeal and bacterial genomic regions that are found in things like amoeba castellanii oh other... interesting so there are some questions up in here about you know those mechanisms and genetic variation and and amoeba as a host in terms of like this matrix of genomic mishmash and also i mean later parts of the paper where they're just like we can't really tell you much about the <laughs> about yeah. the lineage based origin of, of I think some of those amino acyl tRNA synthetases or some of the translational genes, which is like I think where they were trying to go later with yeah. some of this. Yeah. So it, it is a very cool plot, and I, it is I I I definitely was intrigued by those eukaryotic and bacterial hits as well because it's it's you know a question of like what what has the interplay of this. Tupan virus genome been like historically? Yeah, yeah. I, do you know? It's I hadn't even thought about your point about the fact that. So it could be that the amoeba is preying on a bunch of different stuff. Maybe the amoeba has acquired some of these genes, and then maybe the virus ends up getting the genes from the amoeba when it's when the viral genome is getting packaged somehow. I think I think that's what you're. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and there has to be something else if you're ending up with sort of contiguous regions where it's integrated in terms of like how that genetic material is interfacing with things that might be more considered canonically the Tupan virus genome. But like, it, it's, there's a lot to untangle when you consider the heterogeneity in terms of evolutionary origins of, of amoeba genomes themselves you know, based on, and I will send you that blog post because it's kind of interesting because they're yeah, just kind of getting cool. into like, we don't really know how to classify these just based on some of the other stuff we're seeing. Um, and thinking about now this sort of, you know, endocytosed thing with a really big genome where we're not really sure how it got so big and so rich in translational repertoire either. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah, that's a, and I yeah, I really like this plot. I think it I think it's a really great way to visualize this and then think about some of these questions. Um, and then they also on the other side, they've got an attempt at uh, kind of looking at a phylogenetic tree to explore how Tupan virus is related to some of these other giant viruses. So we've got this is based on um, family B DNA polymerase, just a maximum likelihood tree. And they're showing um, the three Mimi virus lineages that we know of. And you could kind of see how they group out and why they are separate groups. And then you could kind of see coming off of Mimi virus lineage A, um, the branch that leads to Mimi virus lineage A, the other um, branch off of that is the Tupin virus. So it's kind of nested in there in between. It's more, it's it's most closely related to other Mimi virus, but then there's it's within a group that includes some of these other giant viruses. I love that there's a virus named cafeteria. I don't <laughs> I'm like I don't know anything about that one, but I'm like cafeteria. Okay. Yeah, that was I I was sort of like that's it sounds really classy too. Cafeteria robergensis. Doesn't virus. it? Yeah. It like, sounds like 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 lots of tables with sort of you know guild inlay and cherry wood and all of your drinks come with like saucers and 
silver spoons or something. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds like the kind of place that you would stop in and like, oh, I'll maybe I'll just have a cup of tea and it ends up costing you like $20. <laughs> stop at cafeteria, Robergensis. Um, but so I thought this was good because they're, they're just showing you, <clears throat> as you might expect, they're kind of showing you where it sits within the giant viruses. And then they're, they're going to argue from this that it's um, a sister group to the Mimi virus, but not, it is distinct. It's not within any of the lineages that they've recognized so far. Um, let's see. Uh, so at that point, let me see. They, I have to admit that I kind of, I read the text that goes with figure four, and I kind of went, because eh. um, I wasn't entirely following where they were going with all of this. Essentially, what they were doing was they were saying, okay, we're going to look at, um, they started looking at clusters of orthologous genes, and I, I've done clusters of orthologous gene stuff before, and, and I always think this, and even though I've written papers that are genome analyses that do these, it's always hard to not just have it be like, here's a list of stuff. Eh. <laughs> yeah, you know? Um, but so I think, I don't know, Nicole, what did, what did you, was there a take home that you came away from, from figure four that, that you think we should go over? Um, I, this was sort of the part of the paper where I, I, started to read quicker because I was panicking <laughs> a little bit. And I think they were trying to make the case that um, you know, they've got they've got those frequencies of the promoter motifs, which are kind of an interesting thing going on there, just to sort of say, look, we've got we've got something in here that's sort of implicating something that matches up, I guess, with what the most frequent Tupan virus promoters should be. But I thought they were trying to make the case that the codon usage in some cases with this genome are matching up to the codons of some of those, I don't really want to say it's the tRNA synthetase, but like matching some of those tRNAs that are encoded in the genome. I thought that was where they were trying to go with some of this. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. And I kind of, I have to admit that when I saw like all the little, all the codons and all the little bars, I just thought, I don't know, man. I don't know that I've got the patience to like walk through all, all the, each individual codon and look at like where all the little bar, you know? So I, <laughs> I have to admit that I kind of went, I think that's a good analysis to do, but I don't know that I, that I, I mean, it's kind of like where you go if you don't have the proteome, I guess, right? I mean, they don't really have a snapshot of our tRNAs involved in making the viral particle, you know, are, are they using tRNAs that are made by the viral repertoire of translational machinery? And I guess by trying to match it this way to the genome, since they have a sequence, that's, that is one way of partially addressing that. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I think they, I think they were mainly, I feel like the, the, let's see. Uh, I really do feel like the, the, the clusters of orthologous genes was, was basically just trying to look at how it, it, it was another way to look at the, like the maximum likelihood tree but it was supposed to take the perspective of not just one gene, but like on the whole, you know, um, how much similarity do they have in terms of what genes and gene families are represented? And it came out that it, it um, two, the two pen virus kind of ended up in the same position as it did coming out of the, the DNA polymerase, the B DNA polymerase tree. So I think it's a good idea to do another way of kind of trying to figure out, is it really fairly closely related to Mimi virus or, or I guess, or the better way to say it is, are the Mimi viruses its most close relative that we know of right now? Here's a couple different ways that we look to see it. You know, we did the single gene tree, but then we also did this clusters of orthologous genes analysis. And then we also looked at the amount of 
you know, the representation of the promoter that you kind of consider the canonical Mimi virus promoter. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, and that's probably fine. <laughs> I mean, I did try to look at the supplements at one point and I'm just like, nope, gotta keep going. <laughs> I, I tried to play the movie and it didn't work for me at home and I was upset because I was like, I bet it's really awesome. <laughs> it is really awesome, but it didn't work for me every time. So something's weird about the download, but it's okay. Um, but so, so now I think what we might want to do is move on to, there's a, the, the bit of the paper that they really focus on in the abstract has to do with the translational apparatus that's encoded by the 2 pen virus genome. And there's a couple of things that I think are, are important to kind of bring up. Um, now they've got, again, I'm going to do this thing where I'm like, they've got this figure and I kind of looked at it and then I also kind of went, what? Um, so they've got a, they've got a figure, figure 5A, where I think what they're trying to do is they've, now I have to say, I'm not, I guess I get why they're doing this, but I, they turned it into a circular genome, which I thought was kind of an odd choice because it's a linear genome, but maybe that's just how people are used to seeing these. I don't know. Um, but I do think it's a bit, it's a bit strange to have forced it into a circle because when you show things like, okay, so in bacteria, when they, when they are a circular genome, and you have a single origin of replication and then you get bi-directional replication and you get all this kind of interesting stuff going on. One of the things that can happen is that you can actually see um, GC skew. So you could actually usually see the origin of replication because you can, you can in fact see like a GC skew if you put one strand of DNA into, into your, your algorithm, it comes back because you could actually kind of spot the origin of replication in the GC skew because it's skewed one way on one side of it, it's skewed the other way on the other side of it. Um, but then on something like this, I wouldn't really, uh, they've got GC content and GC, so these are all the normal tracks that you would see with a bacterial genome, GC content, GC skew, but like nothing's jumping out at me as being like, oh, that's weird. Um, so maybe that's, there, maybe there isn't anything there that is particularly jumping out. I'm um, just wondering whether it was just easier to fit it on the page than a line. I don't know. Could be. That could be. That is, could be. But now that you're bringing it, because I never, I, I don't look at circular genomes enough to kind of deal with the synthesis that you just beautifully laid out. So for me, I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess he went with a circle. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it could, it could very well just be like logistically that that's what, that's what fit there. Uh, but I think the main thing that they were trying to do with this is they had pointed out um, the two outer tracks are coding sequences. And then the inner track is, I see, now that's where I lost them a little bit because I was like, I'm not entirely sure if the inner track color is supposed to be tRNAs. I was, I was confused about what the inner track is. Uh, that red, all the red stuff. But what they are marking is they're marking in in a couple different colors. They're trying to kind of show you where the translation related genes are. So they've got like 70 tRNAs, I think, that they've got marked in different places. And then they've got um, the amino, uh, the amino acyl tRNA synthetases are actually labeled in pink. And I think that's the main thing that they're trying to show here is just visually they're trying to represent parts of the translation apparatus where they're sitting on the 2-pin virus genome. Um, that's what I got out of this. And I, now that I'm looking at it, the, so if you, think about, if you think about them in tracks, you've basically got the outer track and then the inner, the, the next track are the, the ones that all have blue hashes. Those are coding sequences. And then there's a track inwards from that where there's red hashes. And I don't have the foggiest idea what that is now. Because it can't be the tRNAs because there's too many. So I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but, um, but I think what they're trying to do with the labels is they're trying to show you, like, here's where the amino acyl tRNA synthetases are. Here's where the tRNAs are. 
we've got these other, uh, in gray, we've got these other factors that are involved with things. And so they're just trying to demonstrate, like, compared to a regular virus, the way we think about them, and compared even to some other giant viruses, this is a lot of stuff. Um, that's what I got out of, of A. And then they've got a little summary up there at the top right that kind of talks about exactly what they've got in terms of the translation apparatus. And then B, to me, I was like, I don't know what's up with B. Um, so I didn't, I didn't actually follow. And admittedly, I read, the, I read this quickly. So, so this is just based on a quick read. I didn't, I didn't fully get what I was supposed to pull out of B, apart from maybe they're bringing in these other um, cellular organisms that have very reduced genomes, and they're trying to make some comparisons to those, which I think is an interesting thing to do. Thoughts on this, Nicole? Um, I, so I agree with you that like A definitely is just, it's, it's the, it's the detailed inventory of, of those translational pieces and their orientations. I don't really know what the brick red bars are considering that the brick red lines are supposed to be the tRNAs. So that's a bit weird. Um, I'm really never sure what to do about network analysis when it shows up in something where you're not naively trying to establish connectivity. And I, I see where they're going with this in terms of like what other viruses, especially those that are hitting, you know, common lineage maybe or common size are also containing these types of translational machinery. I would have been happier with the table. I'm I'm just that old school. I would have I would have just liked that to be the thing. <laughs> but I do I do like that they actually put the little the little box at the top that's really kind of bringing home what what one of the main take homes of the paper is, which is that there's it's complete. It's complete on paper. And when I say on paper, I mean on a chromosome, which isn't made out of paper. It's just we don't really know what the moving picture of of all that business is yet, though. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think that's that's I do like their little summary. I think that was good and helpful. Um, OK, so we know that it's got all these translation related genes more so than we might expect. Um, they tried, as you as you'd mentioned earlier, they tried to do a little bit of analysis to see if they could figure out the 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 origin. So where did these translation related genes come from? And for reasons that they state, you know, the complexity of the genes, the difficulty in getting um, a clean phylogenetic signal, uh, they really didn't come up with a with an answer for that. And that's I, very, I think, very reasonable. There's the constraints in how you do do the analysis. Uh, and then what they kind of started getting into is they, they've, they and I might skip the figure because I think it could be relative for our purposes, kind of easily summar summarized, which is they've got figure six, which describes the fact that there are in the Tupin virus genome, they found two 18S ribosomal RNA intron sequences that appear to be expressed at different stages of the viral life cycle. And that's kind of wacky. And I think they're not entirely sure what's going on with that, but they were like, that's wacky. <laughs> and they're right. <laughs> so I think, I definitely think that's interesting. And it starts to kind of play into what they actually think is happening during in, in host invasion. And so I thought maybe what we could do is kind of move to the last section which is the host range and host ribosomal shutdown characterization. And so this gets back to what Nicole has already previewed for us at the very beginning, which is they did a bunch of tests to infect different protists, including um, tetrahymena, which is described as a ravenous free living protist, which I really appreciated. <laughs> I thought that was a really nice, vibrant, vibrant uh, description. So they infect all these different protists. And then what they said is they found four um, infective profiles. So productive cycle and permissive cells, which means the host cell gets infected and produces new viruses. Abortive cycle, which I think means the host gets infected, but then nothing happens. And then refractory cells. I'm not entirely sure what that was. I didn't pick up on that. And then non-host cells exhibiting a cytotoxic phenotype 
in the presence of Tupin virus without multiplication. So to me, when they discuss this, it's basically cells that can get, cells that will phagocytize Tupin virus, but then Tupin virus is not gonna uh, initiate the production of the viral factory, and then the host is not gonna produce more viruses, but the host gets killed by something that the stupid virus produces that's cytotoxic. So it's like the host gets a bat, or the, I guess it's not a host, the, the protist that ingested the tupin virus, it's almost like it gets a bad case of indigestion and then it dies from it. Does that sound, do, have I horribly yeah. misstated that? Yeah, um, so does cytotoxic always mean that the terminus is death of the cell? I'm just asking this really naively. I always assumed so. Okay. But maybe not. I mean, I just because I I, 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 I thought that true. one of the things they were trying to emphasize with tetrahymena was also just the fact that it's got a reduced phagocytic rate. So it might be dying, but the point is it's also just less efficient while it's not dead. It, mm -hmm. Picking other things up. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Because I I let's see. Um Awesome until it decreases the phagocytosis rate. Because what it does when it gets into, and they have a whole bunch of figures in figure eight, which, I, which I'm not necessarily going to pull up, but um, figure eight and figure seven kind of just give you a whole bunch of different takes on this idea of ribosomal RNA shutdown and what's happening. Um, when Tupin virus infects a permissive host and, and a non-permissive cell. Um, but one of the things they describe about non-permissive cells is that, so it says, although Tupin virus is not able to replicate within tetrahymena, it is phagocytosed in a voracious manner. Again, I love the description. Um, forms large intracellular vesicles where the capsid and tail release their content inside the protist cytoplasm. And then I think this is, Nicole, what you were talking about. So the virus induces gradual vacuolization, loss of motility, a decrease in the phagocytosis rate, a decrease in ribosomal RNA abundance, and triggers nuclear degradation, similar to the effects observed in a permissive host with high multiplicities of infection. So I think it's heading towards death at that point. If, you're, if your nucleus is degrading. Yeah, I'm looking at the table in the supplement now, and there's like three hosts, including tetrahymen, of course, THP1 and RAW264.7, where infection profile is all described as cytotoxic. So I think, um, I don't even know if they have, they have this fold of induction stuff, so that's the like yield of virus, but I think I'm tempted to agree with you that, that okay. they're really talking death. Um, okay. My brain's probably just glitching. It just oh, no, no. Weird. I think yeah. that's a reasonable question. Yeah, I really yeah. do. Because it's not obvious um, mm -hmm. what you mean. Because you could, you could have toxicity that, that doesn't result in death. Uh, but it results, I mean, you could have a toxic effect, but then the cell can recover. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very reasonable question. Um, but I, I liked this because they propose at the very end here, and I think, I think Nicole, you kind of previewed this, they proposed this really interesting ecological interaction, essentially, I guess, where where they where they kind of what almost it seems like what they're suggesting is so if Tupin virus can't infect, if Tupin virus is not able to turn a tetrahymena or another protist, different species of protist, into a virus factory. It doesn't want to get phagocytized and destroyed. So if it gets phagocytized, but then kills the non-productive amoeba, then that means that those amoeba are not free to continue phagocytizing all of the other virus particles. Like it's it's it almost sounds like it's a way of I can't think of a of um. I can't think of a good way to describe this, but it's almost like the virus population is defending itself in a way. Um, and you're getting almost like uh, you're getting. No, that's not. A, I was going to draw an example it's, of plasmids, but it's like not good. It's almost like a sacrificial. Yeah. Infection, 
right? I mean, this is kind of like where they talk about, I mean, it's not the same, but I mean, when you talk about bacterial populations where resource contexts, and in this case, the host is a resource context for a, bac for a virus, you know, a host to be there to make more of themselves. So the idea that, you know, with bacteria in not great condition, some things will just die. So you have something to cannibalize. In this case, it's more of a virus that's, while the term alive is contentious, it's kind of choosing to enter a host where you will not have replication occur in the interest of improving the targeting of the rest of the population to hosts that can actually proceed to a productive replication cycle. Right, and it kind of, yeah. I, I think what I, the analogy that I was gonna draw, and I don't, I think it's imperfect, but that's okay, many, of, many, many are. I was thinking about plasmids and um, the plasmid addiction systems. So where you have a plasmid and it has a toxin and an antitoxin and the toxin is long lasting and the antitoxin is not. So if you've got a cell that has this plasmid in it, bacterial cell, the toxin and the antitoxin are constantly getting made as long as you've got the plasmid. But if your cell divides and only one of the daughter cells gets the plasmid, but the other daughter cell gets the cytoplasm that includes the toxin, the antitoxin is gonna degrade first. If you can't make more antitoxin because of the plasmid, the toxin's then gonna kill the cell that didn't keep the plasmid. So it's a little imperfect because it's the idea that the plasmid's trying to survive, but, but it's the notion that, that there's some built-in mechanism to make sure if you're not helping me out, I'm just gonna ax you. <laughs> which I think is really interesting. Um, and it makes me wonder, and I'm sure they're thinking about this. I would be shocked if they weren't. It makes me wonder in an ecosystem, in a, in a microbial community, in a protist community, what kind of an impact a virus like this might have in terms of shaping who's there and who's, who's not there. Absolutely. I mean, especially with the deep sea ones. I mean, that's not an energy rich environment. So I'm kind of wondering about like what the co-occurrence of these amoeba hosts, assuming that that's what they're infecting out in the wild are, like where do these viruses end up in a water column to actually have a productive infection cycle is one of the questions I have. Yeah, definitely, I, I agree. Um, we're, we're coming up on four o'clock. So I, I always, I'm always hesitant to, to keep us beyond that. Did you have, we, I mean, there is a ton of data in figure seven and figure eight, which I've just kind of blithely summarized as like, hey, that's kind of cool. Um, was there anything that you had noted that you want to particularly point to before we kind of do a wrap up? Yeah, I think there's just the one point they made about sort of the ribosomal degradation and some of the nucleolar degradation. So this idea of like, well, the thing still has to translate its genome to make more virus, but at the same time, it's kind of causing mass carnage of, of the ribosomal pool. So well, there are some hypotheses that the authors bring forth about maybe there's a small pool that's baited or maintained to actually get the viral factory made. And I mean, that's that's really interesting as to how they get this perfect storm of wrecking its host enough to not get resources devoted to amoeba making its own amoeba stuff, but how do you get enough to get successful infection? So, so that's my colloquial take on this other piece, which is also really interesting from a biochemical standpoint. And I think actually getting pieces of this genome and doing sort of a, um, well, I guess it would be more of a transcript and ribosome sort of assay. So more biophysical ways of looking at the interaction might be an interesting way to see how this viral genome might be transcribed or portions that might be relevant to moving the translational machinery of the host cell towards making Tupan virus. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I just... This is really neat, um, and it's just, uh, there's a wealth of stuff to continue to study and kind of try to pick apart. Um, so I'm, I'm, I was happy to take this little, this little dive into the world of giant viruses, which, which I, we talked about this. This is something that kind of comes across uh, my Twitter feed or comes across 
it, it generally tends to get picked up in news media. So I so I run across it when something new is discovered, but I haven't really had a chance to kind of dig into uh, what are these papers. I haven't had a good excuse to. So I, I was really happy uh, to be able to do that here. And it does, as we discussed, um, give us some interesting things to think about when you're teaching virus biology to uh, to classes. Um, so very cool. Do you have any uh, wrap up thoughts that you want to share before we kind of close out? Um, not much other than like, this was just, it was just fun to read this paper. And I think I'll have fun rereading it later if I teach again with it, just because it's such a neat system to kind of look at from sort of, I mean, it's not really macro, but it is macro in the sense that they could chop it up and do microscopy with it. And then the you know, all the things they've tried to do with respect to sort of the genomics type analysis and looking at gene content. So it's a really nice mix of sort of classical infective culture-based characterization along with using, you know, sequencing technology to try and get a story about what this thing's related to and what it might be doing and how it ended up being the way it is. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Um, so. As always, Nicole, thank you very much for, for joining me. And I will say, um, certainly if you've watched this far, <laughs> you should just uh, join us for our next one. We're always happy to have new people join us. We've been uh, doing this the last Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And we've got one more coming up. So we, we will have one, um, ooh, unless, unless my calendar does something really weird to me, um, which it might do. But we, I am planning to have one, that just occurred to me, um, but I am planning to do one in, in April. But then uh, one of the things I want to put on people's radar, including including you, of course, Nicole, is that the uh, in the summer, the journal club actually goes on hiatus and we do a summer book club. This summer it will be a fourth, which is like shocking to me. But, uh, but this summer I was thinking that it might be a good evolution might be a good theme. I know that's a very broad theme, but there's a lot of things that you could do within evolution. Either there's been a couple of books written for the general public that are designed to kind of walk people, walk readers through the arguments in favor of evolutionary theory. So for people who are kind of on the fence about it, there's been a lot of popular books that are kind of, here's the arguments in favor. And that might be interesting to read, certainly for people who are teaching because you might potentially encounter students who haven't heard this material before. Uh, but also there's, there's great books that are just about particular aspects of evolutionary biology that, that don't really have anything to do with the, the broad field, but are very specific about certain, certain types of, of study systems and so forth. So I would be very glad for any suggestions that people have for books. The way I typically do this is I collect suggestions and then I run a poll and then the top three uh, books voted on from the poll, we do those in the three consecutive summer months. Um, and it's always good to kind of get a head start on that so that people can get books. We can collect suggestions, get votes, and people can order books. So um, I don't know, Nicole, do you have any, do you, does anything just pop to mind? Or do you, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but. I was looking last night and I didn't, I, I... I typed evolution into Amazon. I just, I haven't actually taken any evolutionary biology <laughs> actually in any of my undergrad. Um, I will say this is not a good book for the general public, but I did impulse buy an on sale copy of Carl Zimmer's evolution textbook, Evolution Making Sense of Life. So while we may not read that, I, I am sort of curious as to whether anybody in either of our circles has used that from a teaching perspective or just to get a foundation, because it looks like that might be a good place to start for people who are going from educational things. But I'm looking forward to seeing the suggestions in any case from everybody as this comes together. Yeah, me too. And I have to admit, one of the things that I might put on there is um, I, I will fully admit that I have started Origin of Species many times. And I have yet to actually finish it, <laughs> so that might be a good that might be a good book club book is uh, Origin of Species. I, I'll put that on there, um, and we'll just kind of see what happens. Hopefully, we get some good suggestions. Uh, but for yeah, the time being, 
Go ahead. Oh, one thing. I mean, I've noticed a lot of stuff on my Twitter feed from people I follow on coevolution of parasites with hosts. So if anybody's got some cool books that drop in that direction, I would love to see that. That would be kind of fun. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly like, you know, anything within the range of, of evolution, I think would be would be very welcome. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping we'll, we'll get some good suggestions. Um, but in the, uh, so thanks again, Nicole, and uh, we'll see everybody, hopefully, um, next month for our final one of the spring. So. <laughs>